Hello everyone, I'm David Farzam. Welcome to another episode of New Cancer Mentality. New Cancer Mentality is a place where researchers and innovative thinkers can come and share their thoughts in regards to cancer research and new trends that are going on in the field. Today we're really fortunate to have one of the leaders of surgery with us, Dr. William C. Dooley. Dr. Dooley received his medical degree from Vanderbilt School of Medicine and later did his surgical training at John Hopkins. He is a board member of the Oklahoma Cancer Control Network, and, as well as the G. Rainey Williams Professor and Chair of Surgical Breast Oncology at the University of Oklahoma Breast Cancer Institute in Oklahoma City. So thanks again for being with us today, Dr. Dooley. It's good to be here. Great. So first off, what got you interested in going into the cancer field? Why did you choose cancer over all the other medical topics? I became interested in college in uh, cytogenetics and the generation of aneuploidy or uh, irregular chromosome number. As it turns out, most adult solid tumors have um, an abnormal chromosome number and it's different from cell to cell often and so how that's perpetuated and how the tumor doesn't kill itself off became a part of my interest in research both in college medical school and since and what is cancer could you define it for our audience do you see it being one disease or a complex multitude of many diseases it, it I see it as a complex multitude of diseases that has one particular thing facet in similarity. Uh, when we are born, our cells have sort of like a genetic program that allows them to divide and grow a certain number of times and then they're programmed to begin to die. And if that message of how many times you can divide before you have to die gets erased or is lost, the cell becomes immortal. And the one thing that's true of the cancers that we know of today is they seem to have immortality. As long as they're fed and happy, they continue to grow and flourish. And they get, in the teleologic sense, more selfish over time, so they begin to rob the body of other resources as they begin to become a greater and greater population within the body. And all of these diseases have that in common, these immortalized cells uh, that grow and no longer uh, take the same feedback from their surrounding neighbors and no longer know when to stop growing. Would you disagree or agree with the following statement? Uh, no significant progress has been made in the last 40 years since we declared the war on cancer in 1971. That, I'll have to actually sit the fence there. Uh, I both agree and disagree with it. At one level, I agree because when the war on cancer was uh, first thought of, the idea was this would be like the war on bacterial infection. If we just had a better drug or a better immunization, we could prevent these things from happening. Uh, it turns out cancer is a far more complex disease. Cancer is intimately tied up with the process of aging. So we've got to understand aging to understand cancer and vice versa. Um, so the cancer has ended up being much more complicated than we thought. It is distressing to think that uh, cancer was a major cause of mortality when the war on cancer was uh, first initiated and this year continues to be a major cause of mortality and in fact by the end of this decade, cancer will be the most common cause of death in the United States. With the end of two decades, it's going to be the most common cause of death throughout the world. So we've certainly not made the kind of progress that you would have thought uh, a war on cancer would have generated. Although I think it's perfectly reasonable to say, in spite of all the many millions of dollars we've spent on cancer, if you look at how much we spend on wars and police actions around the world, uh, you could say we spend on cancer on a daily basis uh, only enough to fight a skirmish, not really to fight a war, uh, which may be part of the issue. 
in the other sense of have we made progress, yes we have. But you have to look at specific diseases in, in certain groups. One of the great success stories has been colon cancer. We understand that many colon cancers start as polyps in the lining of the colon. If you screen patients with colonoscopy and remove those polyps, then you may prevent a fair number of cancers. And in fact, we've seen the incidence of colon cancer begun to fall in the United States as endoscopic polypectomy and colonoscopy has become more common. So clearly we're making headway. We've made headway in cervical cancer because now we have an immunization against a virus that's the most common cause of cervical cancer. Unfortunately, there are some big cancers like lung cancer where we've made virtually no improvements. The, the survival for lung cancer today is virtually the same as it was in the early 60s. So we, we still need a lot of progress. We've begun to make progress in breast cancer, although between 1930 and 1996 there was no difference in the age uh, adjusted death rate from breast cancer in this country. Since 1996, we've had an incremental fall each year in the age adjusted death rate from breast cancer. It has only been a little bit, but it begins to add up when this is getting to a decade and a half. What are the biggest obstacles to reaching this goal of potentially lowering the rates that people get cancer? Do we, is it funding? Is it more collaboration between researchers? What would you say is the biggest uh, setback as of right now? We, we still understand very little about the initiation processes of forming cancer and how to prevent them or reverse them before they turn into the clinical disease that we see as cancer. And I think we've spent far too much at looking at a fairly advanced cancers and throwing toxic drugs and treatments at advanced cancer. And we need to do a lot more at this early carcinogenesis and prevention uh, world and because we'll probably get much more bang for our buck. And in essence, that's what's beginning to happen in cervical cancer. Now that we understand the role of that virus, we can have an immunization against it and prevent a lot of cervical cancer. The, it's likely we'll have specific things that will present, prevent or help to prevent specific cancers, but we've got to understand the early phases, and we don't understand that well enough yet in the majority of cases. Why is it that some cancers are age-related? For example, prostate cancer never shows up in children. However, children do get other types of cancers, such as acute myelogenous leukemia, why is it that some cancers are age-related while others are not? I'm going to fall back a little bit to my cytogenetics uh, roots here. Um, if you look at most cancers in their earliest stages, they have an extra copy of one chromosome or maybe have some, a big uh, breakage of a chromosome and translocation of different parts into an abnormal chromosome. And then after that, they go through a phase, they'll be stable for a while at that at one extra chromosome or one abnormal chromosome stage, and then they begin to add extra copies of chromosomes and they get more and more unstable and more and more aggressive and harder to treat. Most pediatric tumors at the time we find them have a single karyotypic abnormality, a single chromosome abnormality. That's true of the in situ cancers in adults, but it's not true of the invasive cancers, the more advanced cancers. They tend to already have a lot of cytogenetic or karyotype variability, and that's not seen in the pediatric tumors until, for instance, in the leukemia, you're having a blast crisis or something like that, and they become harder to treat. So I think if we find these cancers and we understand what the first genetic and cytogenetic events are at forming a cancer, we'll have a target that is much more easy to treat and much more successful. We certainly are in general more successful at treating pediatric tumors than some of the adult tumors and that reason may be this relative karyotype stability early which then degenerates as the tumor gets older.